on our skin We are young, we feel everything Yeah, it's starting to begin Hear the words we were meant so to So guys, sing. Uh, welcome Close to the podcast eyes. series uh, Talking to inspirational people And today I've got a really interesting guy that I want to talk to Somebody that I came across a lot of years ago for uh, something that he done in the area. Um, it's probably around about 20 years ago, I'm guessing. Uh, I'm sure Chris will 22. be able to. 22 years ago. Um, so today we're going to be speaking to Chris McGlaid. And uh, I'm not going to steal your thunder, Chris. Tell us a little bit about um, your background and uh, who is Chris McGlaid for anyone listening. Uh, Chris McGlaid's a tortured soul. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just a radical lad, that's all I am, isn't it? I've been a radical lad all my life and um, became a comedian when I was 24 years old and uh, I've been a comedian for 31 years and I'm 55. Um, I'm proud of this area, I'm glad that we've come to this old blast furnace again. When I, when I recorded this video, The Right To Hear, I mean, that, that, I didn't realise that was going to go viral and I was surprised when it did. But I just thought to myself that the place to film that video would be somewhere that represents our town, do you know what I mean? Yeah. In this area. And the blast furnace for me, it's as iconic as the as the as the transporter bridge or the the Angel of the North, do you know what I mean? So But yeah, I'm a I'm a red clad through and through. I moved away for a little while, uh when I was fighting the political campaign in Red Car, moved out the area for a little while. And then came back to the town back in the last year, um, and I, I, I say it's in my blood. It's where I am. Yeah, and uh, this is this is one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you because um, I know we've not had a, a lot of contact. I'm very aware of, of, of well, who you are. You're a difficult man to get hold of, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, a lot of people say that. Um, what caught caught my eye recently was uh, this video. Um, it ended up in my inbox by about five different people, so it was clearly getting shared a lot uh, about a lot. Uh, how many views has that had now? It had about seven hundred thousand the last well, time I'd seen. I mean, it. I, I listen. It, it was a strange thing you know, because your ego kicks in. You see, like I was coming back on the train in, uh, from London in July, and up until that point, right, it had about maybe on on uh, YouTube. On my, on, on my Northern Monkey channel, it had about maybe, I don't know, 2,000, 2,500 views. And I, I did this um, radio interview in, in London for me to promote my show, uh, my new Edinburgh show, Forgiveness. And I was on the train coming home, and my mate sent me a message, and he went, you better have a look at Facebook. And I said, why is that like? And he went, there was so much going with with your poem. And this Geordie fella called Brian Tuff, uh, well, I've since spoken to him, got, got to know him, and I like him. Do you know, like, I like, you know what I mean? He's, he just mind me saying, I think he's ex-special forces. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's bigger-hearted. Do you know what I mean? And I suppose he's as passionate about his neck of the woods as I am about tea side. Yeah. But he'd he'd seen this poem, or my poem, on uh, YouTube, and he'd uploaded it to his Facebook page. Right, and I looked at it, and it was like nine thousand one hundred views, and I thought to myself, "Wow, do you know what I mean?" Because it was only I couldn't understand it. it was only like two thousand last time I looked. And then I tried to find it on Facebook, and then when I found it, it'd gone from nine thousand one hundred to so like ten thousand five hundred in five minutes. And I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> by the time I got off, it was only twenty thousand. So the last time I looked on on that one Facebook page alone. It had over nine hundred thousand views, but then it's had like it's had like forty odd. Well, the last time I checked uh, on on LinkedIn, somebody liked it on LinkedIn, and it had had the last time I looked on there a few weeks ago, it had over fifty thousand on LinkedIn, and then on other f- Facebook pages, it's had like twenties and thirty thousands, and I don't know how many on Twitter. You, you, I don't know how to monitor that on Twitter. Do you know what I mean? I'm a yeah. total technophobe, so I wouldn't have a clue. Next so I would say that it's probably had like at the moment it's probably had like a million million and a half views if not more do you know what I mean it was interesting because and i got to tell this story right because this like tells the state of our nation right uh, this person I'm not going to because they, they didn't want it to be made public but this person uh, when it all started to roll with, with the point and the right to hate this person got in touch with me from Northumberland 
and they said uh, something really funny happened and I said what was that like and they said well I'm not going to say where this person worked but they worked in like a public place like a shop and this doctor came in right and they said uh, this doctor said have a look at this right and everybody in the shop gathered around this doctor's mobile phone and the doctor showed everybody in the shop all the lasses working there the other people my, my poem The Right to Hate right because I thought it was absolutely fantastic and uh, and I said to this woman this person can I use that can I tell that story because that story for me said a few things right it was like a when they told me the story, and, the, and this doctor said, no, no, you know, I don't want this to be made public because me agreeing with this man, you know, could affect my job. Yeah. Right? As a doctor, just for having an opinion. And that kind of like, really, it, like, it spoke <clears throat> so much to me and it said so much to me because when we're in a situation, right, where you aren't allowed to express yourself or express your opinion right without some kind of penalty without being either forced to apologize or sacked or hauled over the calls in front of your employers and so on and so forth right then we're not living in a free society yeah and i thought to myself well i've got five grandkids here do you know what i mean yeah i've got five grandchildren that are like my life and i thought to myself if that's what it's like now if we don't have, I mean, it was like it was like a scene from a, a wartime. When this woman told me this thing, right, this story, I got this like little picture in my mind, like like a little scene in my mind's eye, one of those old black and white war movies, where you know, like partisans or the French Resistance are sharing like seditious material in secret in case the Germans or the Gestapo find out. Do you know what I mean? all gathered around this mobile phone. Oh, look at this, look at this. It's like, like a secretive kind of thing, you know what I mean? And I thought to myself, we're not in a free country. And if that's where it's like now, what's it going to be like in 20 years when my grandkids are 25 and 22? Yeah. 21, do you know what I mean? So what is the poem? Tell us what the poem is and why did you... Uh, and and, and, and uh, before I forget, um, are we OK to put this poem at the end of this oh, yeah, uh, interview? Listen, so Yeah, listen, well, I, I mean, for me, for me, the, the, the poem... For me, it was a rally against against the political correctness, which I see is is like it's like a part of a creeping fascism, not just in this country but in the world. You know, it it we're told by the exponents of political correctness and those who are in agreement with it that it's there to protect minorities. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't protect minorities at all. What it actually does is it creates resentment, it creates anger, it creates tension. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Even people who, who were supposed to be the beneficiaries of of, of political correctness, you know, people of colour or, or, or gay people or whatever, right? I've had conversations with, with people and, and, and they say it, it, it doesn't protect anybody, you know? Yeah. And, and it's a way of stopping people... It's a way of curbing free speech. It's a way of, of getting to the point where we are now where our politicians are running wick and doing what they like. And you know you've got to watch what you say in case, in case you say something that's like, I, I mean, how can I say? It? They, could, they could call something. You could criticise a, an MP because they're ignoring 68% of the constituents who voted to leave, right? And uh, and if you think that's a sly digger, our MP, yes, it is. Anna Taylor, you're an absolute disgrace. 68% of your constituents voted to leave the EU in the biggest democratic vote that this country has ever seen and basically in you going against the majority of people in your constituency who took part in that vote you've just like st- stuck two fingers up at them and uh, and so we're in a position now where and it's called hate speech you know having an opinion that doesn't go that doesn't sort of like fit with with these people in authority now can result in you getting a knock on the door from the bobbies so suddenly this thing of protecting minorities or protecting this or protecting that, right, is suddenly now protecting the... Uh, they're the corrupt, aren't they? Our MPs this week have been exposed as being corrupt and this political correctness, this curb on our free speech, right, 
this speech that 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 you, you, you that basically carries a penalty if you say things that other people don't like, right? Is now protecting these people, right? Or in Parliament, and they're just running wick. I mean, that's one. That's a good thing with Brexit, right? And, and this is the thing that I like with Brexit, because right? Brexit has has completely exposed, right, the fact that our politicians don't represent us, right? And it's exposed that we don't actually have democracy. We have the idea of democracy, yeah, you know, and it's a great idea. But Brexit this last week, right, has shown that we don't have democracy in this country, and it's also shown that our politicians are in the pockets of the same global corporations who control the EU. So why do you speak out? Why, like you're saying there, why that... do I speak out? I'll tell you yeah. why I speak out because I've got five grandkids, and I don't want them. Right? I mean, I'm old and fucked. I'm 55, do you know what I mean? I've had the best of my life. But I, I don't want my grandchildren to be there to, to, to grow up in a world, right? Or certainly in, in, a, in a country whereby if a doctor hasn't got the right to stand up and say, I agree with this man's poem, right? And he does that, and he can't do that now. What's it going to like say? What's it going to be like in 20 years' time? And, that, and that's. We don't. We don't have a democracy anymore. We don't have any real freedoms anymore. People believe that we have, but we haven't. And I'm doing it for my grandchildren. I want them to be able to be, be governed and ruled, or not, go, not ruled, but governed and represented by the people that we elect. That's the issue, do you know what I mean? These yeah. people that we elect, we elect to represent us. We don't elect them to, to, to represent some, some global corporation who's lobby, lobbying the EU via 33,000 lobbyists every day to get the best deal for them. So tell us about this poem then. That the, um, what was, the, uh, what was the, the meat of the poem? What was the main things? What the, was the, the, po- the, 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 the thing is, the, the, the poem... I, I wrote the poem, uh, let me think now, in 2017 when I came back from Edinburgh. I'd read something about political correctness, and, and I'm, I'm just sick of it. I'm sick of walking a fucking minefield every time I open my mouth, do you know what I mean? You know, I'm a working-class bloke. I use working-class slang. I have done all my life. I'm like probably any other working-class person in this country, right? Our society is dominated by the middle classes. Every facet of our society is dominated by the middle classes, whether it be politics, the media, the TV, theatre, art, film, comedy, music, everything, right? And they all have this same middle class liberal outlook on things, right? They don't understand working class people. They don't understand working class humour. They don't understand working class, uh, what we would call crack. Or slang, you know what I mean? And and I, and I and 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 it's like I use these things. And but if you use, whenever we use working class slang or crack, right? It's just slang or crack. It was never weaponized. It was never. And I say this in my show, forgiveness. It was never weaponized. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just working class slang. But now all of a sudden, you know, you're racist. You're bigoted. You're homophobic. You're this. You're that. They use the ID politics, you're this, you're that, you're that, to, to silence you, to shut you up. And you're not them things, are you? No, um, not at all. And, and you talk about that in your poem, don't you, about people connecting, doesn't matter if you're coloured, if you're this, what religion. I just want pe- working class people to get a sense of themselves. Yeah. I want working class people to get a sense of themselves, right? And to say, hang on a minute, I was in a sauna in Redka the other week, or the month before I went to Edinburgh. And there was a big black fella in there. He was a bit like a bully was from Middlesbrough. Baldy head was his, was his white white girlfriend. And we went up, and he's pacing up and down, up and down. Do you know what I mean? In the sauna, and he went, "Fucking, I'm too fucking hot. I'm too fucking hot. I'm fucking to what, Sean? I'm fucking to what, right?" And he opened the door of the sauna. He said, "I fucking got to get out here. I fucking got to. It's too fucking hot for me in there, right?" And he turned round and he went, "I'm a fucking disgrace to the black race, and a fucking disgrace to the black race." And I started to laugh, right? <laughs> He said, I've got to go, love, I've fucking got to go. Anyway, he shut the door, me and his, his girlfriend, her partner, were talking, like, you know. 
And then about five minutes later, he come back and he asked her if she was coming, and he said, yeah. And I said, yeah, by the way, I said, uh, I said I enjoyed your crack, like I said, you made me laugh. And he shook my hand, and I said, oh, thanks very much for that. He said, oh, yeah, he said, uh, there's some people, if I'd have said that in front of them, he said they would have been like, been like, scr- sh- sh- like screaming and shouting about it. He said, it's political correctness gone mad, mate. And yeah. this, is, this is from a, a black fella, right? He said, it's political correctness gone mad. And I shook his hand, I told him my name, he told me his, give his girlfriend a kiss, right? And I thought to myself, that's a working class fucking bond. Yeah. Goes beyond colour. Yeah. We're fucking sick, right? Black people, Muslim people, white people, whatever you are, working class people are sick of this political correctness. And that is one of the things that made me write the right to hate. Because I don't hate anybody. I've got no malice in my heart for anybody, right? Can I ask you a question on that? Yeah, yeah. In the poem, you uh, you mentioned something which, uh, I mean, for me, it's a bit of an inspiration how you can uh, you can deal with that. Um, your your father was murdered, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and are you happy about telling... Like, yeah, without... Listen, I mean, that, <laughs> do you know what it is? Our dad's murder, for me, is a, is, is a legacy. You know, it's his legacy to me. It's his way of saying, hey, son, right? I tried to teach you right from wrong. I tried to bring you up the right way. I tried to give you lessons in life, right, that'll make you a decent man, right? And our dad's murder, right, for me, is like his legacy and it's his way of saying, go out, you know, tell other people, try and teach other people those lessons I taught you. Try yeah. and bring people together. So I don't mind talking about the old father's murder at all, you know, because I believe that's what he would want me to do. And and in the the in the actual poem, you talk about giving forgiveness to the uh, the guy who who murdered your father. Yeah, because you see, I've written another poem recently, and I, because me me show forgiveness, I I took that to Edinburgh, and it was like it just went crazy. I mean, I had no idea. I took a risk doing it. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm, I wrote a comedy about my dad's life and murder and how those things affected me on the day that I found out he'd been murdered. So I took a risk writing it, but it was like critically acclaimed across the board. It's opened all kinds of doors for me at the moment, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I look at it and I think to myself, like, like, there's posit- positive messages all the time, even in the most negative situations. Yeah. And I think the two, the, the negative and the positive, are vying for control. You've got free will, haven't you? Do you know what I mean? And, and, and it's, ne- it's vying for control all the time. And the only way that I could beat that negative was with a positive. Yeah. And the positive was to forgive the old fellow's killer. Everybody in this country, right, the media... The mainstream media in this country, television, radio, uh, the newspapers, the whole lot, right? They're all hell-bent on having everybody at everybody else's throat. Have you noticed yeah. that? You know what I mean? They're never, they're never happy unless we're fighting. Yeah. Right, are they? They're always trying, and you can see it. It's a very, sub- you know, it's a very sub- subliminal thing at times. But the mainstream media love to stir the shit. They like the school fucking. They like the school shit stare around. Aren't they? Yeah, really. And what we've got to do is we've got to get, get, get up and knock fuck out of them. That's what we've got to do. And the, the, the it's like the the, the the thrive of it, the feed off this negativity and, and this this anger that they create, and 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 there's not enough forgiveness in our world, and there's not enough forgiveness in this country, and this country at the moment is like a ticking time bomb, and we need more forgiveness at this moment in time, and. I, I, it wasn't sort of like me being like holier than thou or, or like self righteous. Our old fellow's killer was in a bad way with himself. Everybody's got a backstory. Yeah. You've got to remember that. Yeah. You know, he was alcoholic, he was unemployed, he was homeless, he had nowhere to go, so he was in a shit position, right? I don't think, I don't think for a minute, he was sort of like premeditated. Our dad's murder was premeditated, it was an argument that went too far. You know, he, and he had the he had the, the 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 opportunity to stop, and he didn't. Yeah. And he strangled him for five minutes. Do you know what I mean? And then tried to cover his tracks by setting his body on fire. So he wasn't in a good position, and I appreciated that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know that he took my father's life, but I I understood that he wasn't in a good position. Yeah, I believe, um, and there's some that I say that hurt people hurt people. 
Yeah. Which is exactly that thing that. And and you see, and this is this, and this is and now I'm glad that you said that. You see, because I was I was faced with two choices. I believe there's like two spirals in your life. There's one that goes up and there's one that goes down. Like a, you know what I mean? It's like uh, you can get carried up or you can get carried down. And if you get on that negative spiral downwards, then you become a hurt person. Yeah. And I wasn't prepared to let the man who murdered my father end my life. Yeah. Because I have people that love me. Do you know what I mean? I mean, at the end of the day, dad's murder, the collateral damage from that was my marriage because because I went into a dark place for a while, lacking in motivation and stuff like that, and it put a pressure on my wife and I's marriage, and we ended up splitting up. So it did have, it did have a bit of collateral damage, but like I got a daughter, I got grandchildren and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And if and it, and it, and 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 I tried to to stay on that on that positive spiral up because I didn't want I didn't want this bloke to end my life too. I, I said in the newspapers at the time, his life was ended. Yeah. Because you know, he got put away for eighteen years. Yeah. Um. But it's just about rising above, and I, and I and I stayed on that that spiral upwards and as a result of that my life's moved on in a positive way yeah and there's something that like exactly what you've said there that um some of that i talk about that in life the most important thing is not the thing that happened to us it's how we respond to yeah, the, yeah, to the thing that happened yeah. to us it's like, that's what i say in my show forgiveness that your life is a series of moments yeah that's all your life is it's a series of moments good and bad and it's how you deal with those moments in that moment that matters right because once you've dealt with them and you've lived them the history and nothing in this will be history this moment now is just gone you know and, it, and it, they're history and you can't bring them back yeah and our dad was a our dad you see our dad was a forgiving man I'm not going to go into it too much because it'll it, I mean I'm, I'm hoping that the show goes on tour anyway there's people now trying to make that happen but Dad was a really forgiving man. He forgave people all his life. And like I say, for me, that was part of his legacy. Because I knew in the moment I decided that I'd, I was going to forgive our dad's killer, it's what our dad would have done himself. Yeah. And have you made jokes about that now? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you actually... Well, you know. I, I just tell the story. Yeah. Forgiveness is a story. Yeah. You know, it tells the story of our dad's life. His working class background in in, in uh, multicultural Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough has always been multicultural. Yeah. Because it's, it's a port and a dock. It's always had an immigrant population. So I tell his life his life story about growing up in a in a in, a, in that you know from an Irish Catholic background in Middlesbrough uh, all the way through his life. Mate now mum, their their divorce, you know, uh, and all of that. My life with them. Uh, the, the domestic violence side of things, and uh, and how all those things kind of like and our dad's irreverence and his own PC humour and his big heart and everything else, how how they all came to the fore on the day that the police told me that he'd been strangled to death and set on fire. Yeah, and uh, and then I tell the story about the the court case and everything, which was I mean we had a laugh during the court case. You'd never believe that, would you? But we did. Our family, and that's our family, you know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change my family sense of humour for anything. But I, I think that's something from from this area in particular. I mean, people oh, say to me, yeah, yeah, we just had the crack. Yeah. We just had the crack there, right? And this is no disrespect to anybody from Newcastle or Sunderland, right? And I know there's a rivalry between the borough, the Mackhams and the Geordies, right? But at the end of the day, Middlesbrough humour, right, is the absolute best, right? And 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 for me, for me in part. Especially in Middlesbrough. Yeah. Everybody's so quick-witted, aren't they? Everybody, they're just up for the crack all the time. And I love it. Like you say, it's like uh, Liverpool, isn't it? Liverpool is is the same. Yeah. Our dad always used to say to me, son, the best humour, right? The best humour is always born from adversity. And whenever you've had, like, hardship, whenever <clears throat> you've had people suffering, right, that's where the best... Yeah. The best humour, the best comedy comes from. Some of the best sitcoms, you think about some of the best sitcoms, right, and they've all been, all, always been set in really, like, deprived situations. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? 
and that that's something that um, I've experienced a lot in the military. Military lads are um, uh, military lads can be shot, blown up, and they're laughing. Someone's lost the leg, and and someone will still make a fucking joke out of it. It's um, but I think that's what gets you through situations. I went to this, I went to this like gig on on Saturday in Cheshire. It was for this uh, uh, young disabled kids football team, and uh, there's about 120 people. It was in Cheshire, and uh, before the gig started, I was I was working with Lee Sharp. Lee Sharp was there, and it was just a a bit of a, a curry and, and rice and stuff or whatever. And then the speakers, Lee Sharp and me. Before I started. This bloke came over, this scouser, and he said, oh, like, you know, as your agent give you the heads up on the gig? And I says, uh, well, it's for cancer, and He went, no, 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 it's for this disabled kids' football team. He said, we've sat them round the front. He said, the parents never get out to socialise really very much because, you know, they've got disabled kids to look after, so it's like a way of them getting their hair down, letting their hair down, but some of the, the young people are here, like, and there's people in the room with cancer and all this, so no disabled jokes tonight. I said, right, all right, then, yeah. I got up there, right, and I absolutely fucking levelled them, right? I absolutely levelled them. I was having a go at this woman with a, with a crutch and all the rest of it, right, and they were screaming, laughing, right? All working class people, by the way. Yeah. Right? And uh, and after the gig, this woman came over, whose crutch I'd been using and taking the mickey out of, right? And she said to me, do you know what it is? She said, my mum... My mum died in March and I haven't laughed at anybody or anything for five months and you're the first thing to make me laugh. And I, I was like, fucking hell. Yeah. And I said to this bloke afterwards, I said, at the end of the day, why shouldn't you tell jokes about disabled people and disabled people are in a room? If your art's good, right? Yeah. If your art's good and your art's in the right place, why shouldn't you tell jokes about people with cancer or disability or whatever, right? Don't they deserve to laugh? Yeah. Don't they, de- don't, don't they deserve to be included? Yeah. And this is what political correctness does. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? I've yeah. gone around the houses, but this is what political correctness does. It doesn't protect people. It doesn't include people. It excludes people. And I can tell from the way that you're getting emotional now that this means a lot to you. What is the message that... Why are you emotional there? What What is your message? What, because, what is I t- it? I'll tell you why I got emotional there, right? Because financially I'm knackered, right? I am knackered, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm knackered financially. I haven't got two pennies to scratch my ass on, right? And I live on about seven quid a day, right? That's all I live on. But... When that woman said that to me, and she's about the third, third or fourth person over my career to say that to me, but when that woman said that to me on Saturday night, right, and she took to Facebook, and because I, I put a, a post every day when I'd run a gig, I always tell people, good or bad, all the gig's gone. Yeah. If it's great, I'll say it's great. I've yeah. got a sand innovation or whatever, I've got a sand innovation on Saturday. Yeah. If it goes shite, I say it went shite. I don't hold back, do you know yeah. what I mean? People might think, oh, what a big, big headed bastard he is. You know, well, that's all, because oh, all my gigs are fucking brilliant, do you know what yeah. I mean? But when I die, I die bad. I, I die out of sight, do you know what I mean? But when that woman said that to me, right, I thought to myself, I don't give a fuck if I haven't got no money. Yeah. And I don't give a fuck if I can't afford to get my teeth done. Can't, I don't give a fuck if I haven't got de- decent glasses because I've touched somebody's life. Yeah. And, unless, and, and until you've been in that position, right, Yeah. where somebody says that kind of thing to you, right, yeah. you'll never understand how much it means. Yeah. When I, when I, when I was performing Forgiveness, I, I performed Forgiveness five times before Edinburgh on previews. And then I did like a 25 night run in Edinburgh. And I can't tell you the amount of people that came over to me and said, you've changed my life. There was a, a somebody came up from, from Bedfordshire who'd suffered murder. They came all the way from Bedfordshire to Middlesbrough to see the preview with the West Garth Club in Middlesbrough. And this person said, you know, you've set me on the path to forgiveness. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that, that's got to be like so mad. rewarding. Well, it's, it's got to be. mad. I, yeah. I can't even describe to you, yeah. Steve. I can't, you know what I mean? For me, I mean, and this is... Oh, and that, but what I'm saying is, I mean, forgiveness all the way through the Edinburgh run, it was like people coming out crying and laughing 
uplifted at the same time. Yeah. And this this is the same thing like what what I get. It's for me and I talk I've talked into this a lot. Um I had a really bad ego issue. So um born and bred in this area, smallest lad in my year. Um and I had a real ego issue with with wanting to say fuck off to the world, I'll prove you all wrong and and I've become successful through my properties and my businesses and things like that, but I honestly believe that once I got the house and I got the car that this is I'd feel amazing and I could do that to everyone and that fucking big hole that I had it didn't do anything for it at all it wasn't until I started giving back helping people with mental health and people coming up to me like that and saying you've changed my life around I was going to commit suicide you, yeah, you yeah, you've yeah, changed yeah. my yeah. life it's like that car that house it means absolutely no. fuck all to me it means nothing to me at all hey, don't get me wrong you know what I mean I, I wish I wasn't in this position financially but but there's things people put and once again you know our mainstream media our society they're all kind of like uh, our society is like has become like a, a mirror a mirror image of, yeah. this, of these greedy global corporations do you know what I mean yeah. everything's about now money money you know what I mean oh 10,000 pound win or lot or bingo oh wow 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 you know what I mean yeah they want people to, and, and people I mean, we all want to be financially secure, but there's things that you just can't put a price on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And and our society. Well, I can I can speak from confidence because I haven't got fuck all. Yeah. And and it's like, but I still know in my heart. I know because I've experienced this kind of thing. Is that when you get that kind of response from people who've like suffered? Do you know what I mean? Yeah like I did on Saturday night, then you realise that life isn't just about money. So what is it with people in this area, right? Because um, what attracted to me to want to do this interview with you, Chris, is people say to me, like, why do I still live in the area? I love this area. Like, I'm fucking born and bred in this area like you, and I, I love the area, I love the people. Um, and I think that, like you say, that people from this area, they've, they've, they've got that human, they've got that... They've got that fight in them, that that that, that thing so we've got in this area. This is, this is this is the thing, you see. I think, I think that we do have that fight in us. But and I think working class people have that fight in them. But I think when they see the level of corruption in the country, right? Like we saw last week. Well, I don't give a toss. Whatever you say, our MPs, right, stuck two fingers up. At seventeen and a half million people who voted to leave the EU in 2016, and they showed, right, their absolute contempt for us, and they showed just really who who they're answering to, and it's not us. And I think when people see that that fight that is in working class people, and this has been going on for years and years. I mean, ever since Tony Blair decided to ignore a million people who marched against the Iraq War, people have thought, well. If he's going to ignore a million, but I mean, any marketing person in the world, right? And I don't know if you were familiar with marketing, but any marketing person will tell you if you've got a million people protesting on the fucking streets of this country, right? Then, then basically, you've got a whole bunch of people in the country against yeah. it. And I thought, when I think when people saw Tony Blair ignore a million people marching against the Iraq War, and 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 it didn't do any good, people have been like ground down. They're giving up. Yeah, they're giving up. So what and is that's it? a sad thing. People are giving up, and it's not just. I mean, yeah, it's this area, but but I mean, look at this place here, the old blast furnace. You know what I mean? What is it with people off in this area? Because I see that fight in people. I see that grit from people from this area, like yourself, like I've got. They want somebody. To Why leave. have we got though the highest suicide rate in the UK now? Like this this area, T side now. What is it? Because, because we've got fuck all. <clears throat> we've got absolutely nothing. And it doesn't matter how much the politicians try and like gloss over it. You know, it's like putting gloss paint on, on rotten windows, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It looks nice, but you go like that, your finger will go through the other side. Do you know what I mean? The whole lot, we've got absolutely nothing. They've taken everything away from us. We were having a conversation here before we started this, and I said, you know, we lost, in the 80s, 90s, lost like 30, 30, 30 40,000 jobs in the steel industry. You know what I mean? That's like, that's like the first day of the Somme. So let me ask you a question that you, um, 
you, you talk about speaking out and this isn't, a, you've, you've done a couple of, um, should we call them destructive things over your time. Um, I first remember um, you being in the papers and stuff like that and I'm going back probably 20 years ago and uh, you, was it streaking at Wembley? I streaked at Wembley, that was all for the, that was all for, for the right cause. And what, what was that, tell us about well, that. I, I streaked for a few reasons, the, fir the first one, I, uh, the, 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 once again the council were going to knock the baths down in a seaside town. I used to, I've always gotten the swimming baths and I said if, I said to this counsellor, I said I'll tell you what it is because you've got a dead cocky with me in the Stockton one Saturday night. You know, and I said if you, I tell you what, if you knock the baths down right, or you, you, you get it passed, I said I'll streak it with me, I'll fucking show you. Cause, and I think Buller were through at the quarter final stage right at that time right. And then I also, I'd fallen in love with a, so I'd put Save Red Cabas on my chest. I'd also f uh, fall in love with a, a, a Scouse girl called Fiona when I was working over in Gran Canaria. And I'd upset her, so I wanted to say sorry to her. And I also wanted to win this competition to send that was run by Bass Breweries, and and the and the prize, the first prize was a um, uh, around the world trip uh, for two people, right? And I said, uh, I, I I thought to myself, well, I could win that and send two young people who've got cancer, right, on a round the world trip before they die, right. And then when Bass Breweries found out what I was doing it for, they said, well, rather than do that, they probably wouldn't have the, the, the energy or, or whatever to do that. If you win the, the prize, then, then we'll give you a, an all expenses paid trip to Disneyland, Florida. And basically you had to get most media publicity with an inflatable yellow space hopper to win this competition. So I decided I would take a yellow space hopper on the pitch when I had my black steam stockings and suspenders on, right, and my Dr. Martins when I, when I, when I was streaking. So I did three things. First of all, to stay, embarrass our council and say, save red car baths. The second one was to say sorry to this girl that I'd fallen in love with. And the third one was trying to win this competition with this yellow space hopper, hopefully to send this woman off uh, from Barnsley, she was. Was any of them successful? Oh, well, well, they flattened the baths. Yeah. But I beat them in the end over in court them anyway. Uh, I think if you want to just thought it was a fucking nutcase <laughs> but this is what you do when you're young and in love but I actually won the competition I actually, I actually got most media publicity with this yellow space offer and I sent this lady from Barnsley she's in a wheelchair uh, she had this thing called lupus and I sent her and her son to uh, and an husband to Disneyland in Florida all expenses paid somebody said well you could go on that holiday yourself with your, with your own daughter. I said, oh yeah, but I've got all my life to do that. I don't know how long this woman's got. Yeah. I saw this woman on Jim, Jim Davidson's Big Break programme. I thought to myself, she's a likely recipient for that prize. And I, and I phoned up the BBC and I said, here, I've won this prize. I've got this trip to Disneyland, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we can't give you a, a telephone number. Write her a letter and we'll pass it on. So her name was Marie. So I'm going to start this. I said, dear, dear Marie, I'd like to send you to Disneyland. And that was it. She went with her family. Nice. Wow. Okay, so what I want to, uh, a, a thing that I'd like to ask you before we sort of finish up is... Um, hey, this has gone quick, isn't it? 45 minutes talking to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that, I just think, that, like I say, what I love about it is, um, I love the fact that, I mean, politics and stuff like that, to me, to be honest, I'm quite ignorant. I don't, I don't watch the telly, I don't listen to the news and that stuff I don't really know mm. much about. I focus on my own stuff, so... Um, some of that stuff goes over my head, but what I love is the fact that you you you're true to yourself. You you've got a message and you're spreading that message, and it's exactly what I'm doing in a different way within my property world, my mindset. And I'm like you. I don't give a shit what people think about me. I'll say what I think, and I know why I'm doing it. I'm coming from my heart. I want to help people, and that's what I love. That that connection. Yes, we're doing different things, but I see a lot of the. Uh, call them qualities or call them uh, some people will call them faults but I see a lot in myself what I've seen what you call them? no see, I don't think it does no does it, does it, I, I don't listen right I don't give a flying fuck right what anybody calls me some fucking keyboard warrior who sits there tippy tappy in a way right when I put this online right right I dare say other people will be saying this and that and that I don't give a fuck do you get much criticism no of course you do because you, you, as soon as you set yourself up as soon, as soon as you raise your head above the parapet right 
then you, you then you get it done you and I don't give a flying fuck you can sit there with your sad lives right in front of your computers tippy tappy in a way right? I don't even look at the fucking shite you print honestly I don't I don't give a fuck right so you sit there right and when you've tippy tappied away after watching this video go and wank yourself into a time warp right because I really don't give a flying fuck Right, honestly, Maybe we should have a competition who gets the most shit out of me and you. Well, Maybe people can comment below something like that and uh, you know, who, who's the biggest all, dickhead you know or something. You have it all, dickhead, asshole, wanker. You know what I mean? Come up with someone original. You know, that, that was one thug fucking. I tell you what, do something radical. You know, put your head above the parapet for once in your fucking lives, right? And just stand up and for something that you actually believe in. You know, don't wait until somebody else starts a ball rolling. Be the first, right? Because that's what I've tried to do all my life, is to be the first and to follow nobody. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And I live and die by the things I say. I'm not, I, listen, I'm not uh, an uneducated man. I'm a very intelligent man. I swear all the time, like, God bless you. Because it, it's a cultural thing, isn't it? A working class cultural thing. But, but uh, I'm true to myself. Yeah. And I'm true to the people that I love. And that's all you can and I'm be. I'm true to the people that I care for. Yeah. And I'm true to my class. No matter what what gender you are or whatever, no what religious denomination you are, I don't give a toss. You know what I mean? I just I, 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 don't, these things don't matter to me. I think this is a problem though. It's like too many people, and I know we're coming to a close now, but too many people are too concerned about what people think about them. And for me, that's one of the biggest things that stops people from doing anything in life. It's that being concerned what every, when everyone else When I the council in Redcar, right, I had eight mail, I had death threats, the police knew the eight mail came from within the council, they did nothing about it, right, and it didn't put me off, right, and on the day that we beat them in the House of Lords, right, in the day that this MP from a different constituency played a film that we'd made about the issue in court, right, in the Houses of the Parliament, right, then I was vindicated. When, it, when a, an, an independent investigation was called for, then all those assholes who like sent me the hate mail and made the death threats and slagged me off and so on and so forth, it didn't make any life difference. I was laughing at them. Yeah. I was just laughing at them. Okay, so one question for you before we finish. Last one. Chris McGlade has died and it's now your funeral and your family and your friends are at your funeral. What do you want people to remember you for? Just being a decent lad, one of the highest compliments. And I've said this a few times, but one of the highest or the the biggest compliments that any working class man or woman can make is that he was one of the lads. Yeah. And one of the lads, for me, if you get that from another working class person, it's probably the greatest compliment that you could ever have. One of the lads. One of the lads means you've got a big ass. One of the lads means you care. Yeah. One of the lads means you love. One of the lads means you try and fucking do the right thing. And that's all I want people to think about me. He was one of the lads. Yeah. I love that. And I've I've loved doing this as well. Um, just that rawness, like I say, someone uh, born and bred in the same town as uh, as what I've uh, been brought up in and. Uh, just someone who speaks from the heart and I see a lot of the values what I have in, in, in what you do as well. So if anyone's watching this, where can they find your work? What um what's your channels? Right, Tell so, us uh, so I'm on uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm I'm on Facebook all the time. This is what the, the, the this this forty five minutes here is probably the only forty five minutes. I haven't been on Facebook for ages, right? But uh so hold on I'm crying still dealing me. What a funny. I uh so you can get me on Facebook. Uh, I've got my own Facebook. I've got like the thing. Well, I've, I have since the, the the poem went viral, right? I mean, I've, I've literally been inundated with like people from all over the world, and I don't, I don't, I don't sort of differentiate, you know. I don't think, oh well, I don't know them, so I'm not going to accept them on my Facebook thing. I accept all the friend requests, even if I don't know them, and from people from the right and from people on the left. So. You can get me on my own Facebook page. You can get me on Chris McGl If you send me a friend request, I'll accept it anyway. You can like my, my Facebook page. You can get me on Twitter. Uh, I think my thing is uh, Christopher MCG8. You can get me on that. Um, and what about the tour? Have you got any more tours? You've just recently well, done it's, uh, well, <clears throat> There's a guy there, uh, international tour promoter, loved. Um, he loved forgiveness. 
They're trying to get a tour sorted, trying to get a tour of America sorted, which would be great. But uh, you can also find me, my, my YouTube channel, which is the, the Northern Monkey, if you like that, uh, subscribe to it, Northern Monkey YouTube channel. Hopefully this video will go on there. And uh, you can find me on most good porn sites as well. Uh, <laughs> I go under the name of Shane Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> What's that uh, Twitter and that? Uh, sorry, uh, Tinder is it? Fab no, Swingers. No, no. Actually, I, when we now last split up, I went on Tinder and it was a fucking freak show, eh, lord. Honestly, some of these women that were—I know this sounds awful, right? but I mean, t Tinder is like full of sad, lonely, miserable, fucking depressed, ugly people like me, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and I looked on this, but even as 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 unattractive as I am, right? Some of the women that that started to like send me. I think as you swipe right for like and left, for, well, some of the ones that I, I was looking at the my, my screen and thinking, I hope those cracks are on my fucking screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gents, uh, there it is the interview with uh, Chris McGlade, and uh, I wish him all the best on Thank his you very tour much. and uh, hoping that this will be the, the, the start. And, and the poem obviously having over a million views, I'm sure this is just the start of summit. So, um, if you've liked this, maybe you're a working class person or you know working class pers uh, people from the area or, or working class people from anywhere around the world, as, as Chris says, then uh, drop us a comment below, um, like it, share it, and we'll see you soon on uh, another podcast where we'll bring somebody else who wants to speak out, somebody who's, uh, who's making a difference. Thank you, Stephen. Can't breathe.